Welcome to the Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician podcast, where we talk to doctors like you about their real world lessons in financial matters and hear from industry experts who can impact your personal bottom line. The host of our podcast is David Mandel. David is an attorney, OJM Group partner, and author of more than a dozen books on wealth planning for physicians. You can find additional audio episodes from our first four seasons on Apple Podcasts and other popular platforms. Now, let's turn the mic over to David. Welcome back. This episode of Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician is part two of a two-part series with Ethan Nakana and Erica Matthew. Our host, David Mandel, will pick up where he left off in the last episode. Erica, let's let's turn to you. Um, uh, we got your your bio before, uh, but tell us, you know, just for the audience, a little bit about where you're from, uh, what your practice was like before. It sounds like you became a medical director. How that's different, you know, just a little bit about you. Well, I am currently living and practicing uh, near Liberty Township, Ohio, which is about halfway between Cincinnati and Dayton. Um, I'm originally from Eastern Ohio, so a lifelong Buckeye. Um, shout out to everyone in my t- hometown of Bloomingdale, a whole whopping 210 people. So I am well, a Hopefully they're all girl. subscribers to my uh, yeah, podcast. I mean, that would be great. It's Maybe a small afterwards. town. I grew up, um, my, my dad's an engineer, my mom's a nurse. So I'm a first generation white collar worker. Um, everyone else has either coal dust or steel mill on their hands um, from a very blue collar part of the world and, and very proud of that. So um, going to Ohio State for undergrad and med school. And then when I came out of training, um, after getting married, we moved to Cincinnati because I placed into residency um, in, in Cincinnati, Ohio for family medicine. And following that three years, then um, I was pregnant at that time with my first child and said, okay, I need a job. Um, we knew that my spouse, my husband was going to be the stay at home parent um, based on his career trajectory. And he said, I'm comfortable with that. And so that's kind of when I started negotiating and got my first job as a primary care doc full time um, with the Kettering system. And after residency, stepped right into that. And then on to, we can talk more about stepping into that medical director role eventually. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, that's that's very helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a lot of, most of the listeners, I think, probably know this. Um, uh, and viewers that uh, o- OJM's main office is in Ohio and in Cincinnati. And Eric and I were, and I were talking beforehand and uh, certainly Jason, who goes all the way back to helping docs in the early nineties and a lot of them Ohio state grads. So I'm sure that it, w- there's not too many uh, um, uh, degrees of separation between uh, some of the folks we help and, uh, and, uh, and you. So um, how did you connect with Ethan? When was that? Was that between the Kettering position and uh, the current position as a uh, medical director? So I was thinking about this and, um, you know, it's like saying, how did you meet your spouse? Right. You know, how did you, how'd you find this other person randomly in the world? <laughs> yeah. um, so honestly, it all started with the zoo and that's Interesting. for me. I'm the mom of two kids. I have a now six-year-old and four-year-old and my husband said, let's take the kids to the zoo. And I said, all right, I'm going to take the day off of work. I have PTO. And I couldn't do that where I was working. I couldn't do that because it kept me from making the amount of RVUs that I needed. And if I took the day off, even though it was a PTO day, it still put a zero in that encounters column. So in essence, it was losing thousands of dollars on my paycheck. Um, and really just the structure disincentivized you really utilizing your PTO. And I'm sitting there at the kitchen table, like, you've got to be kidding me. And after a glass of wine and a good cry, I said, there's got to be a better way. And so I started looking, I knew my contract was up in about a year. And I said, there's got to be a way to negotiate this. I've got to find somebody to help me do this. Because like I said, I'm from a blue collar town. I don't come from some long medical legacy. I don't know how to do this. And I'm okay with not knowing that it's time for someone else's expertise. So finding him um, was a matter of kind of a Google search and a blessing. That's great. Uh, it's a great story. Um, uh, th- we'll have to get the, the zoo and the show notes somehow. somehow. I'll, I'll put that in there. Um, 
And so what was your experience? So you hooked up with Ethan and you said, okay, it sounds like Ethan, you were kind of referring to this too. You guys sit down first and talk about what do you want? You know, what's the ideal position, Ethan? Is that some kind of the, the, the conversation? Certainly you can chime in. And you guys get together to talk about um, what the goal is for the next position. Would that be accurate, Erica? And then uh, Ethan, you can chime in after that. Well, honestly, I about wrecked my car when I first called him, thinking I was calling, getting like a secretary or a voicemail. And I dialed this random number and this man's voice come on, on the phone and goes, hi, this is Ethan. And I was like, I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> like, this guy's actually picking up the phone on the like second ring. I'm shocked. Hi, I sent you an email and wanted, he goes, yeah, I remember. I read your email this morning that you sent. What can I do to help you? And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Someone that will actually talk to me that's not going to push me out six weeks or a month or, oh, let, let me pull over and talk to you, sir. And having that conversation just almost, it was very cathartic to almost vent and say, here's here's the word salad of everything I'm worried about, everything, why I'm calling you and why I need help and where I want to go. And when we sat down, um, Ethan scheduled a, a Zoom call with my husband and I, and I really wanted, you know, it might, that might not be everybody's approach, but for me, that was really important um, because I wanted to make sure that the dream we were dreaming was for our family. Um, and Ethan needed to see that that was important and know that. And he was amazing in terms of picking up on the nuances, the details, and helping to plan that trajectory. That's that's you know terrific, and you know it's not it's very dissimilar as you're talking. Kind of when people come to OJM for financial planning, for investing, for their financial life, you know they want to say, hey, I, I don't think I'm on track, or I need help, you know, but I need to find people who can help me, and I do a lot of those first calls. And when you said word salad, it's kind of funny because you know people kind of go everywhere. I just listen, take notes, and then kind of bring it into kind of like when a patient might sit down with you. And, you know, kind of um, uh, 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 release a bunch of things that are on their mind. And then you kind of take it to, okay, what are we going to do next? And what, what are we diagnosing here? So tell, tell me about the next step. You worked with Ethan on uh, finding multiple positions, honing in on one position, and then negotiating the compensation and other benefits. You know, how did it go from there with the two of you? So at first, Ethan said, give me give me your contract. Give me what you're comfortable with sharing. And I said, you can have it all. Um, here's the contract. Here's what my everyday looks like. Here's what the updated incentives and, you know, bonus structures and quality metrics, you know, that's very important in primary care. Here's how I get my paycheck at the end of the day. Um, and here's the things that I'm worried about. And he really took those two, those two pieces and married them together. He made those, here's, how you get your pay and here's what you like and don't like about it. You know, things that were tangible and intangible, things like being able to take that day off. Um, how do you, the same thing we probably do as providers in diagnosing, he was right. able to do and send a email that consolidated all of that and said, all right, here's what you've got. Here's where you want to go. How do we make those two things bridge together? Interesting. And so from there yeah. on, um, kind of took my information and my resume and, you know, asked for things like, you know, numbers of encounters and procedures that I perform, things like that, and said, okay, here's really what you're doing in terms of your productivity and what type of doctor you are compared to the nation. You know, sometimes I don't think providers give themselves enough credit to say, you're really good at what you do. Um, and you might not realize what you're doing is really profitable or really beneficial for the group that you're working with because they don't reimburse you any differently. The fact that I place IUDs and I'm weight management board certified in addition to family practice boarded, that's something that brings value. So how do I market that value either back to the group I was with or to a potentially new suitor? Yep. So yeah, a couple of thoughts uh, I wanted to you emphasize, and I think this is crucial, uh, uh, you didn't say it this way, but I'll say it this way, which is the data, meaning the data on what you do, right? And the data compare comparative to other docs locally, nationally, regionally, what have you. 
uh, because the other side has that, right? I Absolutely. mean, Ethan, I'm sure you can, now that you're a medical director of an organization, Ethan, working hospitals. And in fact, it's funny because, you know, there's a doc who I'm involved with in, in a business who's been on this podcast a number of times and um, they have a practice and they were trying to renegotiate. And there's actually a data set out there and I can't remember the name, but that the company that, um, that um, uh, 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 makes that data available, they only do it to employers. Physician can't get it, no matter what you want to pay. Right, they've made the strategic decision. We're going to gather all this data, but basically be in the pocket of employers, right? Because they're the ones who pay the most. You know, that's their business plan. So, to they know what uh, what your value is, um, but they may not show their hand on that, right? So, understanding the best you can what your value is in the data, I think, is crucial for everybody listening and watching uh, uh, when you get to that point. And then the other, my question was, Eric, at that point or in both of you can answer this, was it you were thinking, I'm getting all this together to go to my existing employer and try to get a better deal? Uh, or was it, I'm sick of these people, I, we want to move or, you know, this is, I'm done with this, I want to go somewhere else or some combination, meaning so for me open to something was, else, but I'd like to stay It was kind of a combination of both. Okay. Um, I knew that with young kids, I wasn't wanting to relocate geographically. I was willing mm -hmm. to go to another practice, but we weren't moving to California. Right. Um, we weren't, we weren't leaving this area. Um, I also, um, at the time, you know, when, in talking to Ethan said, I, I don't mind where I work. I like the people I work with, but I've asked for certain things and I've, I'm guessing that most physicians can can relate to this where you've said, I need more support staff. You're asking me to meet these specific types of metrics. You know, one of those being like control of diabetes. Well, I need a diabetic educator that's accessible. If you'd like me to meet these productivity goals and these metrics, I need assistance. And those were just, those were certain things that were not met. So being able to take those and identify those um, to serve up as potential negotiation points to either the place you're currently working or your future location. Um, that was something, identifying those was something that Ethan helped me to do to break down and say, here's what I really want. It's not, um, it's not A and B, but it's C and D. This is what I want. And the numbers don't lie. I'm able to produce what you're asking of me, but you're not able to produce what I'm asking of you. Exactly. And so um, what was, you know, how did it go? Meaning what, what did you end up, uh, having conversations with the existing employer and did that work out? And do, did you get A and B or C and D? Did you, um, get only A and then, and, and not B? And did you end up taking the new position where they gave you A, B, C, and D? G give us a little bit of so like, we, what so, happened? So we, so the story goes that we basically, um, kind of put my resume on the market and said, all right, what else exists out there? Are there other locations, places? What's out there? Let's put some feelers out. And like Ethan alluded to earlier, one of the main things was do not consider things, you know, don't go and talk to your current employer before you have other things that you're able to walk away to, because then yeah. you lose that trump card. If you can't walk away from the negotiating table. That's really your biggest, because I'll tell you, those people in C-suite aren't certainly going to go down there and see patients. So <laughs> they don't know how to take out an appendix. So if you're the surgeon or you're the physician that's standing there, they, they have to stay at the table for you. They can't do your job. So really being able to have that trump card um, of having that other job. And that's hard. It is. It's hard to manage a full-time position and start job shopping. And Ethan was able to help with that, um, put those feelers out, get some of those initial uh, phone calls with recruiters and different folks scheduled. Um, so that is something that you don't have to always have on your plate. You can, you know, delineate that out to someone else. And that's where an agent comes in to be helpful and say, this is a good offer. This is not a great offer. This isn't going the way we want it to go go ahead and cut ties with that one. We're going to stay this course. And so when I had um, found the position with the, my current employer, um, I interviewed with them and it felt like, you know, a really great location to work. I liked their opportunities. Um, and so said to them, 
all right, I need to talk to who I'm employed with right now. And for me, that was hard because, and Ethan can attest to this, nothing in business moves as fast as it does in medicine. You know, we as attendings are used to giving an order and boom, it's gone. It's through the prescriptions at the pharmacy for somebody. That's not how it goes in business. It is. And I would, I I would talk to Ethan and say, why is this so inefficient? Why do I have to talk to make a meeting with somebody about a meeting with somebody else? And so sometimes as physicians, we may misconstrue that as someone either not knowing or not wanting us and that being a point of contention, but it's not, it's just how business is done, but we're not business people. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not our wheel time scale. Yeah. Different time scale for sure. Yep. So knowing that, and then um, being able to calm your fears and say, it's all right. You don't have to expect an email back today. Um, cat, sorry. Okay. Um, so knowing that that is really important for providers to know their time scale and be able to have someone to calm those fears. In my case, we were able to go back to my current practice and say, here's what I want. I'd like to talk to you because I know my contract is coming up. And when we laid that out on the table, it was nerve wracking, but it was kind of fun because I knew I had that trump card in my pocket of I've got another job. Even if you say, there's no way we're giving you anything. And because you even asked for it, don't let the door hit you. You know, that kind of fear of losing your job. There was no fear because I had another offer in my pocket. So it was a great feeling to be able to really ask for the things that I wanted. And at the end of the call, letting that cat out of the bag proverbially and saying, by the way, you won't be sloughing me off and not calling me back because I'm on a timeline. You need to speak with me by this date because otherwise I have another position. You'll be getting my 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. So it relates completely to what Ethan was saying before, and it makes complete business sense to me. One of the things you said, Eric, in the process, um, and I want to come back to you for one more question, or actually kind of a two-part question, but um, it sounds like, Ethan, that your role as an agent is is more than just negotiating. You were actually helping Erica, you know, uh, um, find and vet opportunities, meaning that uh, uh, you were working with people kind of like what an agent does, goes out and helps them find, you know, um, endorsements and things like this. Uh, is that something that you're typically comfortable with and the kind of part of the service that you offer to clients? Yeah, it, it's an essential part of the service because as Dr. Matthew said, if you go into your employer and ask for reasonable changes to your contract, one, it's nerve wracking with or without leverage, but two, your employers probably, at least when I was an executive, I just said, no. No, not, I'm not going to give you more money. I'm not, you're going to go back to your clinic and you're going to go back to work. So to me, you have to have a competing offer in order to have any reasonable chance of success getting a salary raise where you are. If you're, yeah, when you're, when you're at where you are. But I, I want to also drill down on the point about your role that is because this, I asked you in the beginning of this conversation, you know, couldn't just a healthcare attorney help uh, do this? But we didn't flesh that out there, but here it sounds like you're doing a lot more. A healthcare attorney is not acting as somebody's, you know, personal agent and going out and helping them find jobs when they're seeing right. patients and Erica's busy with work and family. And it sounds like you took some of that responsibility uh, to at least vet or uh, potentially uh, field some uh, uh, initial opportunities before Erica needed to get involved. Did I hear that right? Yeah. You know, you bring up a good distinction. And I think that's another really important distinction between what we do and what a traditional law firm does, because I know that negotiating one-on-one with a hospital or a practice rarely, rarely, rarely goes well. So I, I'm not going to waste my time or infinitely more important, my doctor's time by going in and asking for a raise without leverage. So the very first thing I do, like we talked about, is we sit down, figure out what matters to you. And then I build the case to create leverage for you. How busy are you? How, you know, something about the complexity of your procedures, your payer mix. Um, you know, let's find you some competing offers. But absolutely, those are the things that we're doing to help our doctors understand how valuable they are. It's kind of like putting a house on the market. 
right? There's all of these features in the home. There's an in-ground pool and there's a, you know, vaulted ceilings. There's all of these features that have value. And my job is to help quantify that value for hospitals and health systems, just like I did when I was on the other side of the table. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like you're doing that. And I guess my point is that you're also, if we're using the analogy of the home, you're out uh, potentially uh, talking to new buyers, right? Absolutely. You're, at, you're, you're, at, you're, Absolutely. you're, you're showing the house to somebody. Yes. Right? So yes. that's that's important because real estate lawyers don't do that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, real exactly. estate agents do that, but not real, real estate lawyers. Okay. Yeah. So last question for you, Erica. So it's kind of a two-part. Well, I guess it's almost three-part. One is... Um, what do you think, how do you think it would have gone if you didn't have Ethan, meaning if you did it on your own? Number two, um, what did you learn from the process overall? You've already given us some, some insights. And, and that kind of relates to number three, which is what do you think docs listening to this and watching this should take away, your fellow your fellow colleagues? So I would say, you know, thinking about how it would have gone without, you know, Ethan's assistance, when we first started, um, I, like I mentioned previously, I was about a year out from the end of my then current contract. And when I called and spoke with Ethan that first day, I said, am I calling too early? Is where am I? Is this the right time to be even looking at assistance for this process? What should I be doing? Sorry if I'm bothering you, good sir. And he said, uh, no, you're perfect, actually, because a lot of times, and I, I it retrospectively had seen this once I thought about it with my practice partners in the same group, that a lot of times, even if there is something that you're interested in or a change in your contract, you may go three, six months in advance to your leadership team to request something like that, get put off, get put off, get put through the channels. And by the time you get to, like Ethan said, the person that can actually make a decision we're a month or two months ahead of when your contract is up. Well, I can't come to work if my contract's not signed. So, well, there leaves maybe 30 business days-ish to complete this transaction. Once you give me my contract, now I take it to someone to start reviewing it and it's not what I want. How do I start that conversation when I don't have anywhere else to go? I am under the gun to possibly not have a job and financial situations can get strained. So you're proverbially up the creek without a paddle at that point. You can't, you can't negotiate, you can't dictate where you're going. So I think that's one of the parts that maybe providers need to be more educated on or, or realize that in their process, starting earlier rather than later only does good things for you. That's great, Eric. I, I really uh, uh, value that comment. And it makes me think of a couple of things. And given time, Ethan, I'm going to follow up with one or two last questions with you. But it reminds me for the listeners uh, and, and viewers, you know, what you just said is very similar. And, and I want to get the, I'm going to ask Ethan this exact question. When should doc, doctors think about renegotiating or, you know, that's going to be my next question. But it reminds me of Colin Carr, who we had at the beginning of this season four, who's a uh, real estate agent, and all they do is represent medical practices and physicians with a uh, uh, medical real estate space across the country. And he was extremely, uh, one of the points he made extremely adamantly was the timing on doing that renegotiation of your lease is so crucial because, and I was hearing it in my mind as you were talking, Erica, because if you wait till too late, even if you have a good argument to make or even you have your all you know, like you have everything your, your research done and everything if you wait to too late you really shot yourself in the foot because are you really going to move you know when you know, i mean what's going to happen this thing is up for you know uh you know you don't have the time to put yourself into the position to say yeah we're going to leave right and it's the same thing with your employment you have to have not only the other option potentially or others but the timing's got to be there uh, otherwise, you kind of get forced into something that um, you're not happy about. Uh, so that's, Eric, I really appreciate that point. So Ethan, that begs the question to you, which will be um, my my second last question. I'll have one to wrap up, which is what is timing? You know, when should folks, if they know they have a contract that is coming up, when do they, you know, reach out to you or just start thinking about, 
hey, I need to start a, a process here. Yeah, for first time attendings, I would say nine to 12 months before you finish training, whether you're in residency or an additional fellowship training. For experienced attendings, renegotiate now. There's no reason to wait because exactly what Dr. Matthew said is what I used to do on that side is I would just slow play you. Oh, hey, Dr. Smith, just we're right in budget season. Give it six months. Well, hey, Dr. Smith, we're in capital planning season. Give it three months. I'll just slow play you. And then it comes down to that 30 day window she talked about where you've got to sign a contract, review it and then make a move. Theoretically, that's just not realistic. So if you're an attending physician who's listening Grab your partners and renegotiate your contracts now. Yeah. So, I mean, no time like the present. And if you're in a situation like Erica was where you're not happy with what's going on, you can't go to the zoo when you want to uh, and other uh, ancillary issues. Um, that's a clue to, you know, it's time to start taking uh, uh, responsibility and kind of the, put your best foot forward. Um because if you wait till too late, then, you know, you, you basically lost all that leverage because uh, the timing works against you at that point. Um, and I agree. Um, you know, this has been really interesting. Um, uh, Ethan, uh, Erica, I really appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, you've got a lot going on, Erica, and I appreciate you spending time this evening to do this. But I think the docs listening um, and watching uh, we really, really appreciate it because th what you went through is something that every doc is uh, um, probably going to experience at one time or another, or at least many will. Right? You know, some just get lucky and their first position's great and everything works out, but that's not how life typically works. Um, and um, I think even more so today, where there's more consolidation. Less stocks coming out and being in private practice. We've seen that. I've been working with physicians for 25 years. And, you know, uh, if they go into institutions, uh, the deck stacked a, a bit against them. And so, you know, having an Ethan uh, to help you, I think, um, is something I, I wanted folks to hear. Um, and uh, obviously, we'll put not only Erica's information there um, uh, in, in the show notes, but Ethan's too. So you can get a hold of him if this was something that's inter uh, of interest. I assume, Ethan, you'll chat with docs uh, before you charge them. I think I saw that somewhere. You have an initial <laughs> yeah. conversation with them. You don't charge to see if there might be a fit. Correct. Correct. And if I can just say one thing that sure. I just want to make sure no, it gets right. on the record, uh, I did not tell Dr. Matthew this, but I've represented nearly 75 doctors similar to what we did for Dr. Matthew. And for this conversation, David, I made one phone call. And it was to Dr. Matthew because Dr. Matthew's mindset exemplifies the mindset that doctors need to be successful in negotiating their contracts. You know, I, she said, Hey, I was nervous. It was nerve wracking. I would have never known that. I would have never looking at her. I would have never known that, but she, you know, to use a football analogy, she stood in the pocket, stood tall, despite all of the guys flying at her and she completed the pass for a touchdown. And I'm just so honored to like get to support her and be just a small part of her journey. But like I said, there was one doctor I called for this and it was Dr. Matthew. That's terrific. I appreciate that, Ethan. And just another thing to, I guess, to add in, I felt like working with Ethan was a very, it's similar to having a big brother or a big sister when you're the younger sibling going on a date. <laughs> um, you know, when you, when someone says, well, they sent me a rose and you're like, so what? He should have sent you a dozen roses. Like for what, this is what's the appropriate thing to yeah. expect. You know, at one point in my negotiation, my, my current employer, you know, stepped up a little bit and added some RVU balances and things to my, my paycheck. And I was like, is, are they courting me at this point? What is this? And he's like, yeah, that's what they're doing. And don't, you don't need to play into that. Right. So just knowing and not being impressed, knowing what is the standard when when it should be a dozen roses and they send you one, you got to have that mm. big brother, big sister to let you know that this is what you should be expecting. Yeah, yeah it's, okay. it's having that perspective and uh, and someone who's done it seventy five times. So that that you know we all are expert in what we do, but we can't be expert in everything. So I think that was the most important uh, thing that you realized was you needed some help, and uh, that, sure. that's true and. 
most areas of business and finance. So with that, Erica, Ethan, thank you so much for being on the program. Um, thank you to everybody who's watching and uh, listening. As always, we'll have another episode in another two weeks. Uh, please, if you feel so inclined, uh, leave us a review, give us five-star review. Um, and uh, if you're a physician who has an interesting story to tell, like Erica, uh, in any area of business, finance, or career, reach out to me. I'm always looking for new uh, guests. We're starting to uh, look at season five already. So uh, with that, thank you both for being on and thanks for everybody. Uh, you'll hear from another and, and hear and watch another episode in another two weeks. Thank you. The Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician podcast is brought to you by OJM Group a multidisciplinary wealth management firm dedicated to helping physicians build and preserve their wealth while reducing taxes. Podcast listeners can get a free copy of our flagship book, Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician. Simply scan the QR code or text WPPOD to 844-418-1212 to request your free print copy or ebook download. Be sure to join David for the next episode of the Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician podcast. It's important to note that this content is for informational purposes only and does not represent personalized investment advice, as the information may not be suitable for your personal circumstances. Please contact your investment advisor before implementing any of the strategies discussed.